my class. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Connected Kinesiologist Monday meetup for Monday, June the 14th. I'm Angela Pereira of First Line Education and the co-administrator of the Connected Kins Facebook group together with Rebecca Adaman. And this evening, we have a special guest with us, Zana Ouellette. And Zana is going to talk to us this evening about record keeping. We've been getting lots and lots of questions. This is a, a second time through with Zana because she was kind of a surprise guest on our last um, chat about record keeping. So she's here again with us in a more official formal category. And uh, we're gonna spend the hour talking about all things record keeping. So welcome, Zana. Thank you, Angela. Uh, my name is Anna Olette. I've been a registered kinesiologist for two years. I currently work in occupational rehab. and I'm also a member of the college's quality assurance committee. Um, so we're viewing people referred by the peer and practice assessors. So I've got lots of experience in dealing with kind of the more formalized uh, elements of record keeping. <laughs> So great. Well, we're so glad you're here. This is wonderful. And what I'm going to do is ask our other uh, participants this evening to introduce themselves. So Christiani, would you mind saying a couple words of hello? Sure. Um, so my name is Christiani. I'm a kinesiologist um, up in Greenstone, Ontario, working in a hospital. Um, and I had uh, completed the MBK program at U of T. Excellent. Fantastic. And Jennifer, are you available to say hello? You are. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Jennifer. I am a kinesiologist in Ottawa, Ontario. I've been um, a kinesiologist since um, I graduated from U of, um, of Ottawa University in 2008. I'm just trying to think of the <laughs> year now and um, taking up more interest in the fitness and um, fitness field, personal training, uh, working at a physio clinic as well as a PTA and kinesiologist at the same time. So very interested oh, nice. in with, yeah, the record keeping, how to really have a good format for, for each one, um, each client that I'm doing. Yeah, and you've got three different things coming together. So the rehab, the PTA, and the personal training. So possibly pretty unique differences between those three client populations. Definitely. Yeah. So I'm all ears. Excellent. Well, thanks for joining us. And Paulina, hello. Are you okay to say a few words of introduction? Yes, definitely. So Great. my name is Paulina. I am, I've been a registered kinesiologist for quite some time now. <laughs> Again, like Jennifer, I don't really remember the year, um, <laughs> but I did, I did the grandfather route and I'm currently working at, in a community healthcare center. And I just wanted to kind of revisit and I just came back from mat leave. So it's been, oh. uh, you know, trying yeah. to get back into the flow of everything. Nice. Well, congratulations. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. um, this evening, our, our chat is going to be pretty casual and uh, Zana has nicely prepared a slide deck for us to guide our discussion. So Zana, whenever you're ready, you can share that and, and we'll just hop right in. So if anyone has any questions as we go, please just speak up so that um, you, uh, you get everything answered that you need here. All right. Can everyone see that? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll get right into things. I'm going to start off with some tips, kind of. Then we'll look at what the uh, college actually has in their uh, checklist for us, and then some case studies to really tie everything together and make it stick. Um, and I think at some point, we're also going to cover some questions that have been submitted to Angela through the group. Yeah. So if you are um, a selected to complete a peer and practice assessment, the peer and practice assessment is there to make sure that you're meeting the standards of the college. We all know that the college exists to protect the public. Um, they're not there to really kind of help you. They're there to make sure that nothing is going wrong and that the public isn't going to be harmed. So when you're kind of looking for more um, advice and assistance, the college is not the first place to stop because they're really only concerned about protecting the public. That's their mandate. That's why they exist. 
And if you are referred to the PPA, they're not there to, you know, check up on your practice, to audit what you're doing. They're making sure that you're not hurting anyone. So does anyone know who you are able to go to if you have any particular questions about your practice? What are some of the groups that can help you out? Any ideas? So I would always go to the association, the right. Ontario Kinesiology Association mm -hmm. or the CKA um, if you wanted some broader information. Um, because unlike the college, they are there to support kinesiologists. Mm -hmm. That's their, their mandate and their purpose. Yeah, that's what I would suggest. And then the other thing is um, possibly going back to your college or university. They may also have some suggestions as well. So moving on to some tips. The number one thing I can tell you this comes up again and again is if you use any acronyms or abbreviation in your practice, you must have a formalized list. This has to be somewhere and it's so that if anyone else looks at your notes, they know what you're referring to. If something terrible happens to you, someone can look at your notes and know what they mean. If you work with other providers, they can refer to that. And if you do get selected for a PPA, when the assessor is going through your documentation, they know what you're referring to. That's one of the things that they're always going to ask you to submit if you're selected for a TPA is your acronym and abbreviation list and not having one or just copying one off the internet is a big red flag. Oh, that's interesting. So does everyone have uh, an acronym and abbreviation list currently that they've got um, on file? We have one that I'd be happy to provide for the group. Um, and Zana, does this have to be um, readily accessible in uh, paper form? Or is this something that you can just have a, a folder, you can just have a document PDF yeah. that gets you forwarded? Just need to have the it if it's requested, okay. it doesn't need to be posted on the wall. You don't need a copy in every paper chart okay. um, kind of thing. It just needs to be there. Great. So then the next thing is a discharge note. A lot of us work um, in situations where we're not the only provider, but if you are seeing a person and then you stop seeing them for whatever reason, that needs to be clearly stated in your chart why they've stopped care with a kinesiologist and kind of how your plan is for them to um, continue their care or um, to stop care altogether. When you're selected for a PPA, they ask you for a complete chart. So from everything from the referral to all of your notes, and it must include a discharge note. So you need to have something in there. I think last time we talked a little bit about sometimes when a client um, dies, having that kind of a note, or when someone stops coming because they run out of funding, or if you complete care with a person and you're ending their treatment, all of these things need to be specifically documented in a discharge note. It can be a regular chart note, say you're seeing them for the last session and you are gonna put in your note that you're being discharged at this time, but making sure that you have that for all of the clients that you see because at some point their care does end with you and that needs to be clearly stated. Okay, for the peer and practice assessment, are we asked to submit one client chart or a number of them? You're typically asked to submit eight to 10 charts. Wow, okay. They don't always review all of them. It kind of depends. If they go through the first one and they're like, this is pretty good. Angela, you do a great job keeping notes. Then, you know, they might only just look at one more. Um, things have changed just this year before they always did the PPA in person. Now they're doing them virtually. I'm not quite sure if they're asking for more or less with that. Ah, okay. Now, when they used to do them in person, that would mean you'd have to live pretty close to the college. I can't imagine someone from Thunder they Bay or someone, you. what's that? They come to you. Oh, they do. Okay. All right. Peer practice assessors are uh, selected by the college, but they're people who have experience. Um, they're all across Ontario. And then they come before they would come to you in your work setting. Mm -hmm. And um, there, you wouldn't really get to pick which charts they looked at. They would kind of pick which ones they wanted to see. I will talk about this, I'm sure. I used to work for a clinic where the clinic manager would just randomly walk to the wall of charts where they were kept. And one of the things that we teach our, our students is you have to make sure all the pages at that time in your chart were affixed. 
what they would do is randomly grab a chart and shake it. And if anything fell out, oh my gosh. So I always remember that when I think about someone coming in and selecting charts. <laughs> Probably doesn't happen now if you're moving away from paper charting. Uh, so then into consults. So again, a lot of kins work in multidisciplinary settings. Yeah. If you're asking someone else their opinion or for advice on your client, that needs to be documented. It, even something as informal as saying, hey, I've got this client, I'm not sure what else to give them. Do you know any other knee exercises? And that person gives you some advice specifically on that client. You need to put in their chart that you had a verbal consult with whoever you had it with and what you discussed. Because when you're asking for specific information, you're bringing that person into the circle of care. And that needs to be documented that you've included them and where you're getting this other advice from. Great tip, yeah, good to know. Uh, legibility is a big one. So I have not seen this um, yet, but I know for other colleges, what the standard is, is that if your chart is not legible, um, you have to pay for them to be kind of decoded. Wow. So if they either, you provide them with your chart, if they can't read it, I think you have a pretty short deadline to provide them with a form that they can read. So usually a typed version. And if you're not able to do that, they'll send it off to somebody and you're responsible for paying to get that um, transcribed into a readable, usable version. So Pauline is asking, what if you don't use charts, but instead use systems like NOD or PSS? And can you explain, Paulina, what NOD and PSS are? So they are, um, it's where you can find uh, an encounter for a patient or client. And because I am working in a multidisciplinary clinic, this is what we use for the, this is what everyone in the center is able to access in order to um, take notes for uh, each client they see. So each encounter they see, they, they just input the information there. And that's how, if we ever need to go back or if we need, we need to um, review a note from a certain doctor or labs or anything like that, it's all found there. Okay, so it's like a centralized system for charting that everyone can access with a password kind of thing you kind of sign in and you can yes. move through the system okay and then specifically do you remember what the abbreviations stand for nod and pss i know telus is with pss but no i i, I completely forgot no that's completely fine i'll just make a note do you are you aware of those abbreviations anna or anyone I'm else not. no okay all right, I'll just make a note. That when a chart is requested, you need to submit everything under that person's name. Okay. So even if it's not your note, other people's notes come in too. Imaging that you've been sent goes in, lab results, um, financial notes. Some people keep kind of separate things. They have their clinical notes and their financial notes. Everything has got to come together. If it's got that person's name on it, it's, it's part of their chart and it um, has to be handed in. Uh, so you would have to probably probably have hard copies of invoices um, and statements or invoices paid paid invoices and, and statements for that client as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you don't have to keep paper charts, but before when the college was reviewing things in person, you had mm -hmm. to be able to get them a paper chart version of it. So if that meant printing it all out, okay. It all out. Now you can submit them electronically. Okay. So that's good to know. So you do have the option. And then you would have to provide um, particular access to your record, your financial record keeping system uh, in order for them to access the um financial information pertaining to that client's session and they'll cross check the invoices with the um the client entry uh, the chart entries i'm sure yeah absolutely right yeah uh, so then we come to the age of consent in ontario this is particularly important because there is no age of consent in ontario so when you're saying that you obtained an informed consent from a client, you need to be very careful about, did you just have their parent or guardian sign a form? Because if that person is 10, 11, 12, 
they're able to consent for themselves and you need to be documenting that. We'll get into consent a little bit further on. I have a case study about it, but making sure that you're not just um, getting parents or guardians to consent and that you're taking into account, um, you know, everybody's responsibility and choice in their own health care. So if you had a 10 year old client who hurt his knee playing soccer, they need to actually review and sign a consent form uh, or is verbal consent okay because of their age? Uh, so you never actually need to have a signed consent form. You just need to have documentation that informed consent was obtained and a signed consent form is not adequate to show that informed consent was obtained. Very interesting. So you actually have to have the discussion yes. document that you'd had the discussion and that there was consent in order to proceed, which is opposite, I think, to what many people think. I think many people think you actually have to have that signed consent form. Right. And how often, you know, when clients come in to see you or when you go to see someone, do they hand you, you know, a book of papers at the beginning and say, fill this all out and sign this? Yes. Has anyone actually explain that? it to you? Have they gone through, you know, the risks and benefits and um, actually gotten your informed consent? Because that's the requirement. Just having that signed consent form is not enough. Mm -hmm. You need to have a note somewhere in your chart that you've had that discussion. Would the college ever go and, and check with a random client to say, this is a peer and practice assessment. We wanted to speak with you about your initial session with Angela. Uh, did she in fact go through with, or what in fact did she go through with you uh, when she first sat down with you um, for I your don't first think session? So. Okay. Typically, when we get the charts, they've been um, anonymized. I okay. Guess, so they've taken out specific references to names. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think they would ever go and ask a person. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe if someone made a complaint, they would, but I don't that think that makes sense. Is just going just to double check. Got it. Uh, and then finally, handouts given. So if you say, hey, there's this really great website you should go to or check out this video, you need to make sure that that's in your chart um, because and it's better if you can have a copy in there because if your handout changes or best practice changes and you've given somebody an old version and then they come back and they tell you, hey, you told me not to bend at the hip, but now you know, I've looked online and it says something else. So having um, a copy of whatever you've given them, either electronically attached or printed out in their chart is best practice. Because if someone ever comes to you and asks, hey, it says you gave them a handout about tendon gliding. What exactly was that? And you don't have access to that. You know, it's a problem. <laughs> So that's a, a good thing to know because in so many uh, exercise therapy software programs, you can update the program and it overwrites the previous date. So you need to um, create a separate program with any progressions such that it has a date stamp on there and also a record that it was sent to the client by email on such and such a date. Yes. Yeah. And some programs do that automatically, mm -hmm. uh, but some don't. So right. just making sure that your your program is in compliance. Yeah, you'd have to make sure that you had a history of, of that program being sent by email yes. to your clients, yeah. All right, so now I've got um, the checklist here. Mm -hmm. So this is available on the uh, CKO website. It's a checklist in general for your chart. So this is very similar to the checklist that the PPA has when they go through with it. And to take a peek and make sure everything is looking, uh, looks right. Um, so I don't think we need to go through every element. A lot of them are pretty straightforward. I'll just kind of highlight some of the important ones. Mm -hmm. So here under general, you can see use of abbreviations, having a master list legend of acronyms that I mentioned before. That's very important. Um, Everything else is kind of the things that you would assume you would need to have. So making sure you're storing it properly, making sure that you have all the information, making sure that you have your assessment, your treatment, what you're doing, why you're doing it. 
And I think that's a really good point, Zana, is the why you're doing it. I think that's one of the things that um, is particularly challenging for, for new clinicians is, is that critical thinking piece. So now that you've collected all this information, note down your thought process as you're going through all of that information. How are you sifting it? What's coming out for you as being particularly relevant? How is that starting to come together to actually form your treatment plan? And what decisions are you making in that treatment plan based on that initial information that you're collecting? How might the treatment plan change with subsequent information that's gathered through follow-up sessions? So it's not just documenting point by point um, the objective measures and also the subjective comments of a client, but your thought process needs to be actually written down as well, which I think is a very good exercise. Absolutely. I think you need to be able to take a chart from nine years and 11 months ago and imagine that it's now in a lawsuit and you're being asked, what did you do with this person on this day? What yeah. did you do with them on the next day? Because, you know, worst case scenario, that's, that's what could happen. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I know to be important is um, including copies of emails that um, you've had back and forth with clients if they needed any clarification on anything or if you're checking in with them in between sessions and also notes on phone calls as well. Yes. So um, those would be important because it does show that you're continually following, following up with your clients and that your treatment plan may change midweek if you expected to see them Friday based on your ideas from Monday and you get a call on the Wednesday that something's happened or you happen to check in with them on the Wednesday, your Friday plan will change. So that those places where decisions are made um, would be included as well. Absolutely. So in the second part of the checklist, one of the really important pieces here is advice to the patient or client. So if you tell someone to go home and use ice, did you tell them to put in a barrier between the ice and their skin? Did you tell them 10 minutes on, 10 minutes off, no more than however many times a day? Um, did you make sure that you gave them all of that, those pieces of advice? And if you did, make sure that you have it noted down for things that you do all the time, especially if you're electronically documenting, it can be really helpful to have just a Word document that has kind of your, you know, how you start your note, how you end your note. For me, it's, you know, review chart um, prior to session, obtain verbal consent to proceed. Um, and I just make sure that, you know, now with COVID, you know, point of care risk assessment was completed, PPE worn, making sure that you don't forget that in one year charts, because it's always the one that you forget that comes up, right? <laughs> So every session you need to be documenting that you put your mask on and that you've uh, actually washed your hands, these kinds of things. I don't know if that's a college requirement, okay. um, but I know it's something that I put in because mm -hmm. I would never want someone to come back and say, this was during COVID times. You didn't make any notes in here that the wow. person had COVID, didn't have COVID, that they were you know, isolating at home. Mm-hmm. I don't think we've come to those those problems yet in the college, and I'm sure in the next few years we'll see people um, with issues coming up over that. But there yeah, hasn't been anything yet. Okay. All right. I have. A, can I ask a question on that? Sure. Yeah. Go for it. Um, in regards to if someone has had COVID, um, what would be, and they have recovered from it, um, what would be appropriate at this time? to just mark it down like uh there i i have the jane up where they when there is an in-person um session that they go through the checklist and review so if that is if that does come up um what would be appropriate um so i think that's the decision that you need to make for yourself as a clinician you know, we all use a different screening process and decide, you know, what kind of patients we're willing to see and what precautions we need to take. Okay. The standards change, you know, almost it seems on a daily basis from Health Canada and the CDC. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't yeah. want to tell anyone how they should manage that. You know, I've also seen COVID positive patients in my practice. Yeah. And I think it's a personal decision and you deciding what you need and just making sure that you document what choices you made and why you made those choices. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
That's a really good comment. It goes along with the notes you would make if a client was sick or if they'd been to the doctor and they had a blood test that you were taking a look at or it had one vaccine or had two vaccines. Um, general comments about their, their overall health would be relevant to include in a chart, I believe. For sure. So then when we come to the consent session, it, it says here, was it a pro, informed consent obtained and documented for the following? So this doesn't it mean, it doesn't say you have to have them sign a form. It doesn't say that you have to have a form that says you consent to kinesiology assessment, you consent to treatment, you consent to billing. You just have to have that adequately documented. And mm -hmm. sometimes a consent form is a handy way to do that, but it's not a replacement for an informed consent discussion. So that's great. That's something that I've learned this evening. I think that the consent form um, for me now will be a guide to discussion saying, here's what's gonna happen uh, today with our assessment. Um, we'll talk at the end of our session today about our treatment plan. And uh, as we spoke about on the phone, here's how we'll go about uh, the billing, here's my professional rate, here's how often I'll, I'll send you an invoice, here's when you can expect a receipt and an annual statement for the year, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's a great idea, yep. And consent is an ongoing process. Just because someone says yes on day one, doesn't mean they're gonna say net yes on the next day. You've always got to check and you know, it took me a little while to get into the practice, but now even when I go to touch someone to correct a form or highlight an area, I always say, is it all right if I put my hand on your back? Is it all right if I touch you? And in the beginning, it seemed, you know, a little excessive, but now it's second nature. And I think that the clients who it does make a difference for appreciate it. Yeah, I think it goes a long way to that professional boundary and that we often talk about the power dynamic between clinician and client patient. And I think that the more understanding and the more empathetic we are towards people where we, you know, it would be really helpful for us to have their hand, our hands on them, asking for that permission really does put them at ease every session. We're checking in with them because we don't know what happened from last session to today. So asking for that permission is, is really appropriate. Absolutely. So then moving on. Um, so here at the collaborative records is an important point that your records must always meet the recommendations of the college. And so this kind of gets into some of those questions that have been submitted. The college recognizes that you are a kinesiologist at all times. Even when you hang up your kinesiologist hat, you're still a kinesiologist. Someone can look you up and find you and say, hey, this person was my personal trainer, but it says here that they were a kinesiologist. That means that they should have been acting to this professional standard. Just like the college cares about if you, know, you um, are found guilty of a crime because you're never completely separated from your registration. This is something we talked about with our ARCAN exam prep students that they were really surprised about. I said, you're about to cross a big bridge here and your professional title is registered kinesiologist. Your clients may call you their personal trainer or their strength and conditioning coach or their sport therapist, but you are going to be identified to the world with this regulated status now. And it's a big responsibility. So that's something that follows you, as you mentioned, everywhere. And that conduct, um, that's going to be your new bar. Uh, doesn't matter whether it's a Saturday afternoon in a park or whether you're actually leading a fitness class or you are working as a strength and conditioning coach. This is now your new, your new public facing status. Yeah. So I think though that was everything I had before the case studies. So if maybe we wanted to look at the rest of those questions now. Yeah, sure. Let me just call those up for us. I uh, will just grab those. Does anyone have any questions so far for Zana? No, and I think Zana, what I'll do is, um, I was just noticing as well that you sent over the neat record keeping um, reminders from the college. And I think what I'd like to do is just share those. Yes. And we'll just, uh, We'll just show people a really interesting summary that they can have. Let me just call that up here. 
So I'll just share the screen. And this is something that Zana mentioned that she actually um, blew up and she has posted um, in her office. And so this just gives you a really quick overview, very easy to reference, maybe to have beside you as you're doing your charting, wherever that might be. So looking for that unique identifier where we were talking about last day, your client could be identified by, by their first three letters of their last name or a particular number and year, something so that you could easily tell the difference between Jane Smith and John Smith, even though their initials were the same. Your signature and professional designation needs to be on every entry. And then your notes, of course, we were just talked about have to be very detailed, more detailed than we actually realize. Components of care to another provider. So any delegation of tasks needs to be reported carefully. And then also, as we were mentioning, um, any advice sought um, from other providers would be needed to be documented there as well. Financial records, really important that you've got a system for tracking those. And then the abbreviations list, which we can provide an example of for you to use. And then we were just speaking about, um, last day we went through this, records should be kept for 10 years, patients and clients under the age of 18, those records need to be kept for 10 years following their 18th birthday. And then we were talking last day, if a client passes away, Zana, we would be keeping those records for 10 years past their death, their date of death, okay. Equipment records, so we need to be checking any of the tools that we're using for measuring to make sure that they are still measuring exactly the way we expect. The informed consent, we had a great discussion about that this evening. And then careful documentation, documentation of where your client came from, how they found you. So, so if you look at number nine, it actually says specifically, a signed form without a record of discussion is not consent, just in case you forgot. Yes, yes. So that's a really important point to highlight for sure. All right, so we can turn it back over to you, Zana, for, oh, we have a couple of questions in the chat here. Um, Paulina's asking, is there anything in particular that we have to provide beside the notes when a lawyer requests all notes from us for an MBA case? I don't know. That would be a question more for a lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, because yeah. I'm, it depends what they're asking for. Paulina, you can go back to a lawyer and, and specifically ask, what do you require? Can you tell me exactly in detail what you need from me? And they'll, they'll guide you through that process. And they'll often say in their letter to you, um, we, we will pay um, all reasonable costs for getting this record to them. So it might be photocopying, it might be a copy, or it might be a, a shipping cost if there's a postage cost to get the package to them. They're usually very easy to work with, very cooperative. So you can go back and ask um, in detail, what would you like to see here? It's, it's not the same as a, a college audit. So they'll be looking for particular information in that case. No problem. And then Jennifer asks, if there's an example of what to write down um, a four to six week strength and conditioning programming for charting, that would be very helpful. So that's a bit different than our day-by-day -day chart notes. It would be more of a tracking log. Zana, is there any requirement from the college for actually putting down here are all the exercises and sets and reps and the periodization that you might go through with a personal training client or a strength and conditioning client? No, the, there's no specifics. And I think this also addresses the, do you have to use a soap note? There is no requirement as long as you're charting or your documentation meets all of the requirements of the college, you can do that however you'd like. Right, right. And Jennifer, do you need any um, sample record keeping forms for strength and conditioning or have you just designed your own and they're working okay? I'm designing and redesigning. I feel <laughs> like um, this is a year of bringing more online um, to not have paper form um, and just looking at what would be legible, clear, like in a table format, um, when to write outside notes and, and all of that. It's just, it's been a bit of a process for me to see what 
I kind of like in that because that is more the context um, the fitness um, the fitness center so uh, mm-hmm. really looking at what the college requires in terms of that type of periodization and um, also following all the other um, steps for for all charting as um, Zaina has said so yeah I'll um I'll keep working with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So my understanding would be that you would need to write a note um, following each session, as mm-hmm. well as having that checklist sort of system. Would that okay. make sense, Santa? Yeah, I've seen people that basically have, um, you know, a big checklist of the person's exercise plan, which they give to the client. The client kind of completes it as they go through, notes down what weights they used, how many reps and sets they did. And then when you're doing your chart note, you know, you put, you checked in with them when they came in, what they were saying. And then sometimes you even say, you know, they completed their independent workout, see exercise log. Okay. Yeah. Could be that simple. Yeah. But then every time that, so that's an interesting It's interesting to me. That's a question I have. Um, If a client is using um, a sheet that you've prepared for them, um, would you make a note for each of their exercise sessions or just the times that you interact with the client themselves? So I think that's uh, how you're practicing kind of thing. What I've done typically is when the person comes in to the clinic to see me, those are the only exercises I'm tracking. Okay. At home, they should be doing stuff every day. They should be managing that on their own, but I'm only tracking when they're there with me because right. those are the exercises that I'm like technically supervising and responsible for mm-hmm. um, rather than something that they're doing at home. That makes sense. That makes sense. Elise and I have worked with many clients uh, at the same time. Our, our team used to intersect quite a bit. And so what we would have is one Um, page that the client would be recording on and then when each of us would go through because oftentimes we'd work with that person but there'd be two or three of us working with them then we would actually note any changes and progress notes so that the other members of the team could actually see what we were doing in in back in the day shared paper charting and then we'd have our own uh, our own notes if there was anything special that we were tracking as well so it was often a combination I've seen that done with different colored pens in, in nursing, oh. not in kinesiology, but okay. where day shift writes in black, afternoon shift writes in blue, and night shift writes in red. That way things are still kind of kept separate. So, you know, tell the patient they can write in black pen, but then have all of your kinesiologists write in green. Right. Oh, you'll interesting. Easily and you'll be able to differentiate at a moment's notice. Right. Oh, that's clever. That's really clever. That's a great idea. So we had some questions from Katie who couldn't make it this evening and she has three questions. And so I'll just tell you all three and then we can start to tackle them. The first one is very similar. The first two actually we've we've kind of covered with Jennifer's question. The first one is record keeping for group classes. Second one is record keeping for training versus rehabilitation. And the third one is what are the various formats that are okay to use? So soap notes, et cetera. So I think number three is the easiest to address. You can use whatever format you would like, as long as you meet all the requirements. Right. Um, I came from a soap note background that I kind of moved into the exercise log with um, a little note at the end. And now I'm just doing kind of a quick narrative note saying what I did in each session. Okay. All right. And then for group classes, um, how does that work? Because you've got six you might have eight, you might got, you might have 20 people. How's that now working? So these aren't coming from any of my experience on the QA committee, just kind of my professional opinion as a kin. Um, when I took the bone fit course, they actually talked quite a bit about this mm-hmm. in a group exercise class, kind of screening everybody um, and with different screening tools that might take a minute or two to use. Um, if you could have all that in your first session and then kind of just putting everything together, telling the person, um, you know, this is, I am a kinesiologist, but I'm not your kinesiologist. This is a group exercise class, not individualized planning. So I don't know if all these exercises are good for you. You should manage them on your own. Um, If you have any problems with these exercises, you know, maybe come see me one-on-one, but I can't give you that attention that I'd give you one-on-one in a group class. 
That makes so a I lot think, of sense. I think there's a big piece to kind of um, preparing people's expectations for what they're getting from you, because there is a big difference between, hey, we're going to spend an hour one-on-one -on -one together versus you're coming for a group class. So I think a, a disclaimer is your best bet there. <laughs> That's a great idea. And we often see those with people that we follow online where they'll either have that disclaimer that is prompted on the screen or they mention it in their introduction. Don't forget that this is general exercise meant to do X, Y, Z. And if you have any particular issues, then you need to see your own healthcare professional, something like that. Yeah. Or right. even, um, you know, doing something like a park queue and just going through that quickly and making sure that there's no red flags, if there's any red flags take the two minutes to talk to that person just to make sure nothing terrible is going to happen in your class. Mm -hmm. That would make sense. So maybe as you're introducing a new participant or you're starting a new session of classes, maybe these would be something that you could send to your students ahead of time when they register. They're given a thank you email and attached to that as a survey or questionnaire, a screen that they need to complete and return it to you before the first class. Absolutely. That would work. That's great. And so that would also, uh, with uh, Katie's other question, record keeping for training versus rehab, um, this is something that we were speaking of earlier that the highest standard is the fallback. So you are um, doing personal training with able-bodied um, fitness approach. You are also able to do that rehabilitation, prehabilitation approach but your standard is the registered kinesiologist standard. So you're functioning as a personal trainer, but you are a licensed um, healthcare professional. So that would be your obligation, would be the ARKIN standards. It follows you wherever you are, whatever you're working, whatever your job title is, you have to meet that standard. Right. Unless there's something where, you know, you can be very clear that it's not that, that it's a group exercise class. Um, you know, these people are not your patients, They're, it's an episodic care, um, and that it's separate and different. Right, okay. So you would have a separate record perhaps for your group classes, because you might be able to say for these next six weeks, here's what I'm gonna be covering in each class. So there might be an education piece, your warm up, your cardio, your strength training, your mobility and stability training, and then your breathing or relaxation at the end. So you're actually still planning each session and mentioning what those components might be and the exercises contained in that, but you're not actually addressing a particular participant in your class. Right. Okay, great, that's good to know. Any questions from anyone before we jump into case studies? Could that also be applied, not necessarily to a group setting um, as a class, but also individual care? if there is a disclaimer that um, there's a certain, I'm just thinking out loud, That's but right. if there is um, yeah, a certain level of care that the person was looking for and under the college, is it up to me to treat everything um, or to discern? <laughs> Um, how to best care for that client. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I would check the there's, there's critical, like think, there's, um, there's a certain mindset in rehabilitation and to move into empowerment of how that person is viewing continually getting treatment and where I have seen as well, strides can be taken. And, there's a different language as well as um, let's focus on what is going well and moving into a certain direction instead of looking at what else can we restore. It's, 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 um, it can be blended in in a way, but a certain language can be taken. I think that's what I'm trying to <laughs> formulate yeah. thoughts a little bit. I think you're, you're, what you're mentioning is you might have different languaging with someone who is generally healthy and looking to improve certain components of their fitness and mobility. Yeah. And you may have different language. Again, if someone had been in a work-related accident or a car accident, or they might be 
um, recovering from a new hip or new knee surgery. Yeah. I think that in those initial sessions, you're defining those goals with that client specifically. And so you would come to an agreement on what your goals would be session by session. And then of course you always have the ability to refer to someone else mm -hmm. saying, you know, I'll cover these goals with you, but I'd really like you to consider seeing this person who yeah. would be better suited to manage these goals for you. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. So you, you wouldn't need to feel like we could and revisit. I feel like there's ongoing discussions and revisiting. Um, absolutely. Every and, session. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because so if there's, you know, an area where you're not comfortable, that's okay. You don't have to be, nor should you expect to be um, mm -hmm. everything to everyone. I think we all, we all have our sweet spots of where we'd like to be and, and we can easily refer to others if we need some help. Yeah. That's what I would really suggest because it only builds your network and helps you with future referrals anyway. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions before we dive into some case studies? No, everyone's all right. Okay, Zana, take it away. All right, so I've got five, but I think we'll just look at number two. Now I'm curious about the other ones. <laughs> There, so none of these case studies are really like um, typical everyday things. All, they're all a little bit different because that's the ones that are worth talking about and sharing, I think. Right. Oh, interesting. Anyone want to take a stab at what Brenda should do there? So I'll read this in case people have us plugged in while they're gardening or cooking or going for a walk. Brenda is a registered kinesiologist working in an assistant type role in a long-term care setting. She typically delivers an exercise program which has been prescribed by another regulated clinician. The other assistants are not regulated professionals slash registered kins. When other assistants see a patient, sorry, a client or patient, they simply initial the bottom of the exercise plan. How should Brenda ensure that she is meeting the college's guidelines for documentation? Does Brenda need to change the current documentation system? What are your thoughts? Anyone want to take a stab there? Well, I think for me, I would like to see the other assistants make a note um, if they're seeing the client or patient, because I would like to understand what was actually happening when they were interacting with that person. Now, can they make a note in a chart being kept by a registered healthcare professional? if they themselves are not regulated. I mean, usually when an exercise program is being done, there's, a, there's advice being given about technique and things that you wanna be documenting and you all wanna be on the same page. So, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, putting initials is not enough and there need, I feel there needs to be more communication. So probably the documentation system has to change. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any thoughts on that one? So when I wasn't regulated way back in the day and worked with an athletic therapist and a physiotherapist and a physician, I was still documenting what exercises I was doing because they may have been different than what I was initially charged to do because a person's condition changes day over day. So I can say, you know, we attempted these exercises as delegated, but they weren't effective today. So here's the adaptations that we made and what we were able to accomplish. And this would be the homework that I would assign that client or patient to do following our session. 
and then I was signing off on that uh, on that chart. So what are your thoughts on this one, Zana? I'm curious. Uh, absolutely. So this is not meeting the college requirements um, right. for Brenda if she's just initialing at the bottom. Um, so this can be a very difficult conversation to have with your boss, with your employer saying, hey, you know, I, you know, you probably didn't know, but um, I'm a registered kinesiologist and I need to tweak things a little bit to make sure that I'm meeting my college guidelines and we don't end up in legal trouble. Um, and, you know, so phrasing it as something, hey, let me help you out here. We probably just forgot about this, you know, asking the association can be a great way to get some help approaching that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but absolutely, there needs to be some more information, even though you're working in a support role, you're still held to that higher standard. The college actually has an article um, called the importance of record keeping and support roles to kind of give you a little bit of guidance there. But essentially, you have to meet the college requirements regardless of what role you're in. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. It's great. Any questions about this case study? And Santa, would we be able to get a copy of your other case studies? Because these, I think, would be very good discussions to have in our Facebook group, just to get yes. some opinions on them. That would be a really good um, kind of collaborative thought process that I think would be great. Uh, sure. Sorry, I have a question. Sure. So for, let's say, someone who has been following a certain kind of protocol that I'm just thinking back to when I was working at a clinic and what we used to do is just chart what exercises they did. And then the same thing, just initial at the bottom. Right. And this was done for each and every patient that came into the clinic. And there was no um, guidance. There was no instruction to make clear notes about it or anything like that. So I'm thinking like, I'm thinking about recent grads or kinesiologists who have been doing this for all of these years and aren't aware of the changes and um, the modifications or, or what we should be doing, right? And for example, if you are audited, what would happen? So, you know, what would be your explanation as to, well, I, I, I wasn't informed or, I, you know, I... Uh, this is how they've been doing it, right? So how could, you know, what would you have to do? So what would you suggest there, Zana? Um, unfortunately, not knowing what you're supposed to be doing or finding it too difficult to change is not enough. Um, you have the responsibility as a regulated professional to know what the requirements are to make sure that you're providing safe care and essentially that's why we have record keeping is to make sure that we're providing safe care and that's the mandate of the college the ppa and the referral to the quality assurance committee is not supposed to be punitive they're there to help you fix your practice um, you can be referred from the qa committee to the disciplinary committee but qa is not punitive it doesn't show up on your profile um, it's not published for the world to see like it is if you're referred to a disciplinary committee. Um, try to follow the guidelines and standards as best as you can, because, you know, you're regulated. That's your license. You have the responsibility to be practicing to the standard of the college. Um, and if you there are errors, they will be pointed out to you if you're referred for an audit. Um, but it's best to not have any, obviously. Because mm -hmm. I'm just thinking back as to, you know, when I started and again, you don't really think to have these discussions with the clinic director or, you know, if this is how you were trained, then that's how you're going to continue doing your job, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, I'm just trying to, you know, like kind of voice what maybe recent grads or people who haven't kept up, you know, just, you know, these little issues that might arise if there hasn't been any proper guidance, really. Right. I, I started personally as a PTA 
um, like role after graduating before writing the exam and after studying for the exam writing exam and realizing what my requirements were I ultimately decided I had to leave that position because it would have been next to impossible to make it fit the requirements and I mean I've seen that recommended for people that perhaps that position that you're in is not the best job for someone that wants to maintain their license. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Now, you're a registered kinesiologist. You can serve in that physiotherapy assistant role, but your standards are to the registered kinesiologist standards. Yeah, so your position title may be different than your actual responsibility. And I think to have that discussion, I'm sitting down with a clinic manager to say, hey, it was just brought to my attention that um, I need to make some changes in how I'm managing my record keeping. Um, you know, here's our record keeping checklist. Um, can you help me with uh, making these changes in a way that um, is going to be simple for, for the clinic? And so you're just kind of shrugging your shoulders saying, this is just what I have to do in order to continue in my role uh, let's figure out how we can manage it together. It's not easy. Nope, it's not easy. And it, you may, as Zana said, you may have to make some tough decisions about needing to move to a place where your role is respected, your license is respected. Um, and so that, that may be something that people have to think about if they have a difficult conversation and it doesn't go in a way that keeps them operating according to their professional standard. It's, it's not an option. It's, it's a requirement. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for this. Does anyone have any more questions before we, we wrap up another, another week? No, this was great. I really enjoyed the discussion. I learned a lot. And I think every time we have these discussions, I go back and look at my chart notes again and again. So thank you, <laughs> I appreciate it. All right, so um, as we do, we will have this posted tomorrow on our YouTube channel so that you can go back to it and um, play it while you're actually looking through some of your notes and, and review some of the high points that um, you may just want to review with your um, associates and in your clinical practices as well. Thank you, everybody. Have a good week, Santa. Thanks very much. Thank you.